So the, uh, the next session, the title of the next session is going to be No More Second Send, Fast Simultaneous uh, Settlement Across Blockchains. So the speaker is going to be Cheryl Goldberg. She is CEO at Arwen and a professor at Boston MIT. Please welcome our speaker. Professor at Boston University, but oh, not at MIT, sorry. it's okay. All right, um, so I'm gonna switch, switch gears here completely. Um, so we just had a great panel on regulation. I will not be talking about regulation, what many of my friends up there did such a good job talking about, that I spend such an amount of time talking to them about too. Okay, so today's, this talk is gonna be about protocols. So I'm gonna start off by telling you what is the space that we're gonna be focused on, and then I'm going to move into just like diving into Bitcoin and cross blockchain protocols. So if you're a protocol geek, you're gonna love this talk. Um, okay, so um, here's the space we're working in. We're considering uh, over-the-counter trades of cryptocurrencies. So most people in this room know that um, most trading activity in this industry happens in one of two ways. Uh, the first way is through exchanges, and then the second way is through bilateral deals between counterparties. So there are companies who operate as basically uh, provide ways of buying large amounts of Bitcoin, let's say you want to buy a million dollars or four million dollars in Bitcoin, you, and you want to do that in one shot. It's harder to do that on an exchange, so often people will go through um, OTC desks that will be able to facilitate those trades for them. So in this world, um, the way that it typically goes is the trade execution phase is when the two parties agree on the price. So we have Alice and Bob, and they are communicating over some kind of chat app, actually. Typically, this will even happen over WhatsApp or Telegram. They will agree on a price, and then after that, they will settle. So settlement is the point where the assets actually move from Alice to Bob. So what's interesting is that the price is agreed at the moment that the price is agreed, and that's you know, based on that price at that moment. Settlement could happen even 24 hours later, depending on the relationship between Alice and Bob. For the purpose of this talk, um, we're gonna think of Alice as basically a smaller player and Bob as a big player. Bob is a trading desk, Alice maybe is a high net worth individual or something like that, buying, buying Bitcoin from this desk. Um, and they want to do um, this deal, so now they're going to settle the deal. So the first step of settling the deal is actually connecting with each other and figuring out what your wallet addresses are. So you'll use your chat and your email client, you'll mail each other addresses back and forth, um, and then you'll engage in what's called a second send protocol, which is very simple. One party sends first, so in our case, Alice will send Bitcoin first, and then another party will send second, that will be Bob. Um, it is deliberate that Alice will send first. It's because Alice is smaller than Bob. Alice has less power in this negotiation, and so she has to go first. For all the crypto and security people in the room, um, who has more risk in this settlement process? Is it Alice or Bob? Alice. Alice, right? So Alice sends first. She gives up her assets to Bob. That means she takes all the settlement risk. Bob has a moment in which he holds both assets. So we say that there is um, significant counterparty risk in this arrangement that comes from Alice having to basically trust Bob to send her back the ETH um, after she sent over the Bitcoin. Um, this is a very asymmetric process where there's, um, you know, if it's clear that one party is more powerful than the other, it's very clear who goes first. But there are deals where it's not as clear who needs to go first. So then there needs to be a decision about who goes first, who goes second, and that sometimes causes deals not to happen. Um, and then, of course, there's um, the manual nature of this process where we're sending back and forth addresses over whatever we're sending, email or, or telegram. Um, and like every step in this process requires your counterparty to acknowledge that they received what you thought they received, right? So you sent over a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. You're going to wait for the acknowledgement um, before you kind of go away and do something else, right? You're going to sit there and make sure your million dollars were received. So that's the, um, that's the process that we go through today. Um, we are here to improve on this process. So most people in this room have heard of atomic swaps. Um, this is sort of the classic place where we want to use atomic swaps. An atomic swap gets rid of a lot of these problems, in particular three and four. We eliminate the counterparty risk of one party having to take all the risk and the other party having to take none of the risk. Um, so because this, the transfer will happen simultaneously. And then we also have to, uh, we also get rid of this question of who goes first. So we don't have to debate that anymore. So, um, how can we use atomic swaps to solve this problem? Before I get into that, I want to talk about what is an atomic swap. So I know in this community, um, people sometimes use atomic swaps to describe specific protocols. I am here to say, as a computer science professor, please stop doing that, okay? Atomic swaps is a security property. It is a definition of what it means for something. It's a definition of correct behavior um, between parties, right? So an atomic swap just says, 
If you have an atomic swap of two assets, what that means is either the assets, Alice assets and Bob's assets, either they swap them, right? So that's the thing you can see on one side, or the swap never happens, Alice keeps her asset, Bob keeps his asset. That is the definition of the atomic swap. It just means that either you do the swap or you don't do the swap. There's no risk of this where both the Bitcoin and the ETH go to Bob and Bob gets to keep them both. This is impossible with an atomic swap. So an atomic swap rules out this outcome. So that's just a security property. We sometimes see people talk about this atomic swap or that atomic swap. Those are all implementations of this security property. Okay, so we know the security property. Um, this is going to solve the problem of counterparty risk because if you are certain that if you send your asset, you will receive the other asset, then you have no counterparty risk, right? So we've eliminated that. Um, and if we can make this symmetric and not have to worry about who goes first, we no longer have this decision or about who has to go first. That no longer has to be part of the negotiation of the deal or potentially called, cause deals to, to fall through. Um, right. So that's why, you know, this, that's why this is sort of the perfect use case for atomic swaps is to settle these bilateral trades between counterparties. Okay. And especially because these are very large trades, you know, you really don't want to be risking your principal here. So, um, so how can you do settlement via an atomic swap? So the, in fact, atomic swaps are used today in traditional finance, if you think about it. If you think about my definition of atomic swaps, which is either the assets move or they don't move, that's what's happening now. What happens in traditional finance is that Alice and Bob will give their assets to a centralized party. That centralized party, once it receives both assets, will transfer the assets between the two parties and then it will leave the custody of that centralized party. So through a centralized agent, you can do an atomic swap um, and it's actually easy to do. You can do this with, um, with blockchains. You can do this with uh, digital assets. All you have to do is basically have a wallet that can receive Bitcoin and ETH, and then you need a database that says, you know, whose Bitcoin belongs to who, whose ETH belongs to who, and then you sort of take the money out of the wallet and send it to different places, right? So this Bitcoin came in, it went out to Bob. The ETH came in from Bob, it went out to Alice. Okay, so you can do that with just a wallet and a database. And in fact, um, there are a number of players in this industry that are building exactly this. They're building a centralized settlement and clearing platform for bilateral trade, which does exactly what I said. Um, of course, the issue here um, is that it's a centralized party, um, and the centralized party essentially has all the control here. So what we've done is we've eliminated counterparty risk for these parties, but we've introduced the centralized party as a point of control and potentially a point for risk. Um, and that's very sort of dry, but then if you go into the philosophical le le level and the reason that I'm in this industry and many of us are is that essentially if you're going to do things this way, there's no particular reason that we need to be using blockchains at all. Um, this is how we settle, you know, traditional trades. This is how we settle, um, you know, you can do this with corn, you can do this with stock certificates, you can do this with gold. You don't need blockchain, you don't need Bitcoin for this. There's nothing special here. So at least at Arwen, we think that blockchain technology has significant value um, that can be extended to a lot of different use cases and we want to be using that value to do things that are impossible in the physical world. So the cool thing is that in the blockchain world, um, you can actually do atomic swaps. So we have at least one traditional cryptographer in the world, DL. So in the crypto world, we call uh, this property, atomic swaps that I'm using here, is called fair exchange. So fair exchange was proven to be impossible without a trusted party. That was proven in, in the 90s. Um, but it turns out that you can actually get around this result when you have blockchains because you essentially use the blockchain as the trusted party. The cool thing about using a blockchain as a trusted party is it's still a blockchain, it's still distributed. Um, it's not a single point of control that, that one per person can control, at least for most blockchains um, that we consider blockchain. So, um, okay, so the great thing is we can do this on blockchains. Um, the only downside is that you need uh, to actually have a protocol for this, but from my perspective, this is really exciting and fun. So now let's see some protocols. Well, not yet, actually. Okay, so here was my, here was my slide about let's see some protocols, but we're not there yet. <laughs> Okay, so, okay, so, so um, very exciting use case for um, decentralized as atomic swaps is this bilateral settlement of trades between counterparties. So, um, what do we want from a system that operates in this, in this ecosystem? So, one of the things we want is non-custodial. So, non-custodial, um, when we say non-custodial, we mean that if we were, if our company, Arwen, was to build something, we're not gonna become the custodians, we're not gonna hold anyone's assets, we're not gonna control anyone's assets. We don't wanna introduce another point of control or a point of risk. Um, we would um, allow parties to do this, but they don't need to trust us or anything other than the blockchain. So if you believe in the integrity of Bitcoin blockchain, you believe in the integrity of the ETH blockchain, then that should be sufficient for this protocol to be secure. 
Um, the other thing that we're gonna focus on in this talk is we're gonna be doing uh, cross-blockchain protocol design. So there's been some cool uh, new results on uh, pegs across blockchains and things like that, inter-blockchain communication like out of the Cosmos world. Um, we're not using any of that here, we're using the native blockchains themselves. Um, I could talk for a long time about why I think that's a better idea. I'll try to keep it short. Basically, we don't have to consider any new uh, ecosystems here in order to understand the risk profile involved in these protocols. We're just using Bitcoin blockchain, Ethereum blockchain in this talk. Um, okay, so now getting into the nitty gritty details which actually determine what the protocol looks like. One thing that we really want to have is we want parties to be able to go offline. We don't want to assume that they're running a huge server that's got 100% uptime in order to be secure. We want them to be able to come on, do something, go away, and know that their um, settlement was secure. Okay, so that's a very strong requirement for us, allowing parties to come online and go offline and not have to do anything else. Um, another thing that's very important for us is symmetry. So if you think back to this Alice and Bob trade, in this case, Alice is selling Bitcoin and buying ETH. She's the smaller player. What happens if Alice was uh, selling ETH and buying Bitcoin? We're now, you know, now we swap, we, swip the, we swap the asset that Alice is actually um, selling. We cannot have the protocol depend on what asset Alice is sending. It can't be that the Bitcoin person always goes first because we don't know who the Bitcoin person is going to be. The Bitcoin person could be a big desk or it could be a small person who's buying from the desk. So this is a little bit subtle. Let me say it again. We cannot have a dependency on who goes first or who does something first on the basis of what currency they're actually using. Right? The reason for that is because we, what really it matters here is who is smaller, who is more powerful, and who is less powerful. We can't predict who that's going to be based on the asset we're selling, so we can't say the Bitcoin person always has to go first and do something and so on. Um, and in a second, I'll show you why that's important. Okay, so to give you the spoiler, this is basically what our protocol is going to look like. It's going to have, we call it the four dots protocol, actually, because there are four dots. The first two dots are to um, actually transfer your assets into a smart contract, either on the Bitcoin blockchain or on the Ethereum blockchain. Once those are confirmed, then we do a swap step, which actually transfers the assets across those, um, across those smart contracts. So the user will come on, do the transfer, and then they'll come on again and do the swap, and that's it. They don't have to do anything else. Okay, so that's, that's the UX, and then I'll now show you how you build such a, such a protocol. Okay, so um, last year, uh, I was in the room when James Prestwich presented this very, very cool a result called Stateless SPV Proofs, which I think is amazing. Um, but I wanna show you why that's not gonna work for us here. This is an adaption of um, the protocol that he described here last year. Um, so this is an atomic swap between Bitcoin and ETH. It's an on-chain swap. Um, and um, the first step is for Bob to transfer Ethereum into this smart contract. So you can see the smart contract up there. The font is very small, so let me tell you what the smart contract says. If six confirmations, if we see six confirmations on a transaction sending Bitcoin from Alice to Bob, right? So you see a Bitcoin transaction with six confirmations. That transaction sends Bitcoin from Alice to Bob. If we can see such a transaction, then we're going to send ETH from Bob to Alice. Okay, so this smart contract is smart enough to be able to take a Bitcoin transaction, look at it, see how many confirmations it has, see who it's sent to and from, and if it's the right people and the right amounts, it will then send the ETH over to Alice. Okay, so this is a very, very smart, smart contract. It has a lot of functionality and it's doing a lot of things. So if we had such a smart contract, we can do something very simple on Bitcoin. We can send a transaction from Alice to Bob on Bitcoin, just send it, and then we're going to copy that transaction from the Bitcoin blockchain. Sorry, this is a transaction where Alice transfers 0.3 Bitcoin to Bob, just directly. Um, what will then happen, we'll send that to the um, Ethereum blockchain. This smart contract will see, oh, that transaction is good. It has enough confirmations. Great, now I can release the ETH. Okay, so it's very cool. It's very simple on Bitcoin, very complicated on ETH. Um, it has this property of being non-custodial. There's no trusted party here. All of the logic is happening inside the smart contract. Um, we don't have any side chains or pegs or anything else. This is just native Bitcoin, native ETH. But this is not a symmetric protocol. And the reason it's not a symmetric protocol is because Bob always has to go first. Bob always has to um, set up this smart contract first. Why? Imagine Bob did not set up this smart contract first. If Alice sent her Bitcoin to Bob, she has absolutely no reason to expect that Bob will send her anything, right? Alice just sends him Bitcoin and he's like, great, thanks, bye, right? He doesn't need to do anything anymore. Okay, so this is not a symmetric protocol. Lack of symmetry is very problematic because in this case, if Bob, like in our example, is a big trading desk, he is not gonna wanna lock up million dollars worth of Bitcoin 
a million dollars worth of ETH for this unknown Alice that he's never met before, who may never actually transfer the Bitcoin, right? He doesn't want to lock up these funds for Alice because he doesn't know who she is, doesn't trust her that much. The balance of power is all off here. This won't work. Okay, so we don't want this because it's not symmetric. Okay, so let me go into um, another approach. So this is the Tier Nolan 13 approach. How many people have heard of the Tier Nolan protocol? Okay, so we've adapted Tier Nolan to work on Ethereum a little bit. Um, okay, so Tier Nolan protocol, we have our own terminology at Arwin that we like to use, which is puzzles and solutions. I don't know how many others use this, but this is really HTLCs for others who are familiar with this stuff. So we like to call them puzzles and solutions. So Alice is going to pick a solution, XA. Her solution is a random number that she picked. She's gonna keep it secret. She's gonna generate a puzzle. The puzzle is the hash of the solution, okay? So good thing it's a hash because just knowing the, the puzzle does not allow you to get the solution, right? It's hard to reverse the hash. So if you see the solution, it doesn't mean you can figure out the puzzle. Okay, so Alice picks the puzzle. Now we're going to have her set up an escrow. What her escrow says basically is that if I reveal my solution and Bob signs, then you can take the funds out of this escrow. Okay, that's the first way that the funds can leave. So either the solution is revealed and Bob countersigns, or Alice can just take the funds out of this escrow after some time. Okay, so she has some time after which these funds basically revert to her. She has the ability to reclaim the funds. Um, the next step is for Bob to set up his escrow, which is very similar. Um, again, it's saying if the solution is revealed, then we're gonna send the ETH to Alice, right? And if the solution is not revealed, um, then Bob can then retract this and get the ETH at time T1. So there should be a one there. Okay, so both of these are basically HTLCs. When the solution is revealed, um, the funds can move out of the escrows. If the solution is never revealed, then the party that funded the escrow can take back their funds, and they don't have to give them to the other party. That's how we end up with an atomic swap, right? The idea is if the solution is revealed, it will, cause, it will make, allow the funds to move on both escrows. If the solution is not revealed, then the funds will revert to the people who put the coins inside those escrows. Okay, so um, how does this actually go? Um, when, they, when these two escrows are set up, Alice is going to reveal the solution. She's gonna send it to the ETH blockchain. That's gonna cause this ETH to move to Alice, right? So this is Bob put in 100 ETH. Um, now the ETH will go to Alice because Alice released the solution. And then Bob will see this solution he will then say, now I can actually claim the Bitcoin. He will sign the signature that he needs to sign, take the solution, and then claim the Bitcoin that he deserves to claim at this point, okay? So why is this an atomic swap? Well, it's because this value XA, Alice's solution, determines whether the funds will move or not. If XA is released, the funds will move. If it's not released, the funds will not move. The really cool thing is that um, if it's released only on one blockchain, you can just copy it from one blockchain and move it to the other, right? So if Alice decided to be sneaky and not tell Bob that she's released uh, the solution, Bob can still go to the ETH blockchain and find it, right? right? And Alice, if Alice wants to claim the funds, she needs to reveal the solution. So if she needs to reveal the solution, Bob can always find the solution and get it to claim the, use it to claim the Bitcoin. So that's why it's an atomic swap. So this is Tier Nolan adapted to Bitcoin and ETH. Um, Okay, so the only thing about this protocol is that it's not symmetric, again, okay? So one of the reasons it's not symmetric, you can see that this had to go in a very particular order. Alice had to escrow her Bitcoin and then Bob had to escrow the ETH, so Alice had to go first, okay? So again, I'm harping on this lack of symmetry, but if you think about it, the entire existence of second send is the lack of symmetry, right? The person who's smaller always has to go first. So you're not gonna have any success with a protocol that tells the person who is bigger to lock up funds first, right? So we really, really strongly need the symmetry property. And then afterwards, I'll, I'll take questions. But essentially, we've been obsessed with the symmetry property at Arwin as like a requirement for making this practical. If people actually are gonna be using this, they're not gonna wanna lock up funds first um, if they previously were sending second, right? So we couldn't force people to lock up funds first if they were always sending second in the past. Okay, so again, not symmetric. All right, so I'm now going to show you how to make this symmetric, okay? So um, it's kind of obvious after you see it. So you should probably read the first line and just be like, oh yeah, okay. All right, so the way to make it symmetric is to put in two puzzles. So now Alice chooses a puzzle, sorry, Alice chooses a solution, hashes it to get the puzzle. Bob chooses a solution, hashes it to get the puzzle. Now we have two puzzles. Now they can actually escrow at the same time, 
Okay, so we don't care who escrows first anymore. We can have them escrow at the same time. So, um, by the way, with the previous one, I didn't really get into this, but Alice always has to escrow first, right? Because if Bob escrows first and he commits to this solution, right? And Alice is like, oh, sorry, there's no escrow here. I'm not going to ever, um, you know, I'm not going to ever set up an escrow for you. Then why should, you know, why should, why should Bob believe that this revealing of the solution will actually do anything from him? He needs to know that Alice has committed to the solution before he will be willing to commit to the solution. So when you have two puzzles, you don't have this problem anymore. Now you can have them escrow at the same time, right? And each party knows if the other party backs out, then they can just throw their solution away, never reveal it, and there's no risk that their funds will be taken from them. Okay, so we have a simultaneous escrow. So they can, want, Alice can go first, Bob can go first, they can go at the same time, we don't care. It can happen in any order. Um, and the protocol looks almost the same as Tier Nolan. So the, the difference is that in Alice's escrow, we need the signature of Bob, we need the solution of Alice, the solution of Bob, in order to move the funds. If we fail to get that, we would just have Alice reclaim the funds after some time. So that's Alice's escrow. All we've done is put an extra puzzle in here. Um, Bob's escrow is a little bit weird. So um, the, the sort of obvious clause is if both solutions are revealed, then um, we can send the ETH to Alice. Okay, that's obvious. So we need two solutions to send the ETH to Alice, just like we would have in Bitcoin. Um, now there's the refund clause. This is the case where the solutions are not revealed. So previously we've only had two time locks. We've had the ETH time lock and the Bitcoin time lock. If you want to have symmetry and order agnostic, what we're going to have here, you actually need extra time locks. So what we have here is we say, if, only, if, if the XB, if Bob's solution is revealed first, then we send the ETH to Bob at time T1, which is an earlier time. If Bob never reveals his solution, he gets his ETH it refunded to him later at time T2. Okay, so if Bob reveals his solution, he gets it refunded before Alice gets the refund. If Alice releases the solution first, she gets the refund um, before Bob gets the refund. So we have two different time locks. We move them around depending on who reveals the solution first. Um, I'm not going to really explain how this works. The only idea here is like we don't know who goes first. Who goes first determine the time locks. Since we don't know who goes first, we just have two time locks and we change them on who goes first based on who goes first. That's why it all works. Okay, so we have these two escrows. We set them up at the same time. Now, in any order, we can do the following. Alice can release her solution and send it to the ETH blockchain. Bob can release his solution and send it to the ETH blockchain. And then once that's done, um, uh, Bob can claim the Bitcoin by producing his signature, grabbing the two solutions, and putting this transaction on Bitcoin. Okay? So the idea is we just release the two solutions, we produce a signature, and send it to Bitcoin. Uh, send it to Bitcoin to, to claim the Bitcoin. Okay, so these two, these two values will cause the ETH to move to Alice. This, these two values plus the signature will cause the Bitcoin to move to Bob. And um, those of you who are paying attention know that I'm cheating here a little bit and I'm gonna tell you how I get around the cheat. So how many people see my cheat? Does anyone see my cheat? Can you see my cheat? Good. So I'm cheating a little bit and I'm gonna show you how to get around the cheat. Okay, so I'm now gonna claim that this is non-custodial. It's non-custodial because there's no Arwen key here or anything like this. It's Alice's keys, Bob keys, and the solutions that they hold. Um, there, it is uh, native blockchains. Again, we're just using Bitcoin and ETH, and now I'm gonna claim it's symmetric. My claim is because we can do the escrows in any order, and we can do the swaps in any order. We can release XA and XB in any order. We don't care, right? Alice can release XA first, Bob can release XB first. We don't care. Okay, so. Now I'm cheating, so now I have to tell you how I fix this. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll show you how I'm cheating because it's too exciting. Okay, so um, what's the problem here? The problem here is that Bob can't actually go offline. Um, if we're gonna want Bob to like come release his solution, go offline and never do anything again, what I show you doesn't actually work. Okay, let's, let's look at what happens here. Um, we have um, the solutions being released over here, X, A, and X, B. Let's say Bob releases his solution first. He cannot actually create this transaction and put it on the Bitcoin blockchain to claim his Bitcoin until Alice's solution is released. Okay, so this thing cannot be, this king cannot be uh, posted to the Bitcoin blockchain until Bob knows Alice's solution. Okay, that's the problem. That's where I'm cheating. So how do we solve this problem? Um, Right? This, this claim transaction, Bitcoin claim transaction, cannot actually be posted to Bitcoin until both parties have released their solution. So that seems to impose an order because Bob has to put a signature here. Okay? That's the problem that we have. All right? So let me show you how we solve the problem. 
the problem is solved using something that we call a cross-blockchain copier. If you follow layer two, um, it's a new name that I came up with on Friday. Um, so there's, um, there's uh, if you follow like Lightning Network, you may have heard of watchtowers. This is a similar concept, but it's not the same. What this thing does is it copies publicly available information from one blockchain to another. So it just looks at Bitcoin, sees publicly available information there, copies it and puts it on ETH. It looks at ETH, finds publicly available information there, and copies and put it on Bitcoin. So this is not a custodial or trusted party. It's just something that's looking and copying from one blockchain to another. Okay? So we can solve our problem, actually, by putting more information on the ETH blockchain and then letting the cross-blockchain copier just move it back and forth at the appropriate time. So the way that I'm going to change this and solve this problem is Alice is not just going to release her solution. She's also going to release... Um, well, actually, what's interesting is Bob. What Bob is going to do is not just release his solution, he's also going to release the signature on a Bitcoin transaction that would claim his Bitcoin, plus the Bitcoin transaction that would actually claim his Bitcoin. So we're going to take the Bitcoin transaction that we would have put on Bitcoin, and we're just going to stick it on the ETH blockchain, and it's just going to sit there. So what Bob is going to do is he's going to release his solution, put this extra transaction for Bitcoin, but put it on ETH, and then he's going to go away. Alice will similarly do the same thing. She's going to release her solution, and she's also going to release her refund for Bitcoin. In, this is, I didn't really go into this, but when you want to claim your money from Bitcoin, if Alice was in a refund case where Bob backed out of the deal, she would need to claim it somehow. We're also going to put that information, um, whoa, sorry. We're also going to put that information on the ETH blockchain. So now, if we have our cross-blockchain copier, what it's going to do is it's just going to sit here. It's going to see, oh, look, I have everything I need now. I've got the claim transaction. Bob's signature, Bob's uh, solution, and Alice's solution, and now I can create the claim transaction and post that to the Bitcoin blockchain, okay? So the idea is that the cross-blockchain copier has the ability to just move back and forth and copy things back and forth. So <clears throat> this is the way that we make this symmetric. Um, what I, I guess what I want to say here is that we think of a cross-blockchain copier as something that anyone can do. You can be your own cross-blockchain copier by using a block explorer grabbing a transaction, parsing it, and then posting it to another blockchain. What we are um, building is actually a cross-blockchain copier that will allow this protocol to operate very efficiently. So if you want to use our cross-blockchain copier, then you would be able to do this protocol very efficiently. If you didn't want to trust us, you could similarly um, you know, just basically do this on your own with um, block explorers, with code that we would provide, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that we, can prov we, can, we have this protocol that allows you to, um, that is symmetric, through the use of the cross-blockchain copier and allows parties to take actions and then go away because what we're doing is providing as much information as is needed in order to execute the protocol on the ETH blockchain and allowing it to be copied back to the Bitcoin blockchain. Anyone who's built atomic swap protocols knows um, that in the background, what you actually always have is one of these things, which is a cross-blockchain copier. You're all, if you're operating some sort of service that's facilitating um, atomic swaps, what it's always doing is really like looking at one blockchain, reading stuff off of it, copying it to another, and back and forth. And so we're just sort of formalizing it with this. And I have now run out of time. Thank we'll you. Take, uh, one question. If there is a brief question, please. And then um, Yayo, if you'd like to come and set up in the meantime. Uh, thanks, this was great. Uh, what are the timeouts that you define in Arwen, and uh, how do you avoid the inadvertent call option, which is what BitMEX calls yeah. the, yeah. Okay. So we still have, the, um, we still have the, the free option problem here. We haven't solved the free option problem, but we have it for both parties. So basically, like, if Alice wants to abort, she can by not releasing her solution. If Bob wants to abort, then he can by not releasing his solution. I mean, in, my, in our own team, we debate this a lot. Here's my personal view. My view is that because this is settlement, this is post-trade settlement, this is not a moment at which we're agreeing on price. This is we're settling a trade six hours or 12 hours later. I don't think that the call option matters as much because we're not negotiating the price anymore. The price is set, you know, like six hours before and then this is when settlement happens. So I'm not as concerned about the free option for this particular use case. But you're right, we do have a free option there. Um, both in Alice and Bob. So what is a free option? Free option is the power to abort the deal um, without the other party's consent, essentially, right? Um, and it's true that Alice can both, Alice can abort and Bob can abort if they want to. Um, but, but I'm not, cons right? Because both, either one of them can refuse to release the solution and that would be an abort. Thank you, Sharon.